Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you. <laughs> you fill our very being. You fill our lives. Thank you, Lord. You inhabit our lives. Thank you, Lord. We pray that you'd speak to us, that you would tr we would truly be awake to you in this session tonight, that we would truly be awake to what you're wanting to say, how you're wanting to lead us, how you're wanting to speak to us. We'd be sensitive to you more than anything else tonight. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that we are truly to be a generation of dreamers and visionaries. It's the promise as your spirit is poured out. Lord, you promised the feeling of what the prophet Joel declared. Uh, the young men shall have visions. The older men shall dream dreams. We shall prophesy in your name. We thank you for that, Lord, that we walk and live in that season, the acceleration of that season. And Holy Spirit, we rely on you and we trust on you in you for this tonight. Amen. Amen. Wow, that's good. So good. You come out at 5 p.m. on Sunday night to be a part of this. Um, I pray your senses would be awakened tonight as we walk through this journey that the Holy Spirit is but just wanting us to give us dreams and visions, but our senses are truly awakened, our, our smell, our hearing, our sight, as visionaries that we're awakened, our language is awakened in the Holy Spirit. But above all, our main sense, our first sense, not our sixth sense, our first sense is the Holy Spirit, that we're hearing from him and that we're listening to him. And in that, that we'll have discernment. Uh, as we as we listen tonight, as a pastor and as a leader, and I know Craig would echo this, uh, this having discernment and having wisdom as we hear from God, as we have a dream, as we have a vision, as the Holy Spirit is downloading to us, this discernment is a, is a big deal. And over the years, uh, these 40 years, I've seen so much lack of discernment sometimes with people that particularly in the prophetic realm, so it's important that we get this right. And I just, my foundation I want to lay is, uh, layer this with is some discernment filters for all of us that will apply to everything we hear tonight. And everything, as you listen and uh, understand the prophetic realm that's available to every one of us as the body of Christ. Um, we don't want to get messed up with all of this. So there's just four discernment filters that are really important to us, no matter what we see, no matter what we're dreaming, no matter what we're hearing, each of these are important. And the, the first one is, does what I'm seeing, hearing, and as a result, what I might have to say, look and sound like Jesus? Does it look and sound like Jesus? That's our first clue. Because everything, as, as, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, is anchored in the fact that you know, in the former times, God spoke, to, spoke through the prophets, all who had just a shadowed view of God. But in these days, he's spoken to us through his son. He speaks to us through his son and through the Holy Spirit. I love what the Passion Translation says in, that, in Hebrews chapter 1. In these last days, God now speaks to us openly in the language of the son. Yeah. And so this is our first filter for discernment. Does it look like Jesus? Does it sound like Jesus? Uh, is it, does it feel like Jesus? And, and we, we have no excuse not to understand that because we have the Gospels. We have Paul, the apostle, the, the, instructing us. We have, you know, the, the letters instructing us in all of this. The book of Hebrews is instructing us. Does it look and sound like Jesus? Which means, does it look and sound like the cross? Is, is it redemptive? The cross is redemptive love. Is it, is, is it redemptive love? In all of that, does it look and sound like the Father, the Father's ways? Because Jesus is revealing is the perfect revela revelation of God, the perfect revelation of the Father. So does it look and sound like Father? Remember, even Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. I only, I only speak what I hear the Father saying. And so as this flow through, through Jesus, does it look like Jesus? Does it sound like Jesus? And if it doesn't, then we're not discerning properly. There's a lack of wisdom in all of that. And so following on from that, 
The second thing is it anchored, our discernment anchored in the way of love. God is love. And none of the gifts, and none of, whether it be prophetic, whether it be our seeing, whether it be our dream life, matter squat unless we understand that it's flowing through love. Flowing, flowing through his love. We can read about that in 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, love, love doesn't traffic in shame or disrespect. And so there's no, there should be no shame attached to anything prophetic. No disrespect attached to anything prophetic. It should never be ego driven. You know, it, I've seen this too. This is, this is why discernment is so important. And Bethany and I were chatting about this. So many people get a word from God and they want everyone to hear it. But they're so blind to the fact that God's actually speaking to them and wanting to encourage them. And so they get a word. Sometimes it may even be a corrective word. And, they, and there's this mindset, it must be for someone else. But it's actually God speaking to them. And maybe you've heard people with, you know, delivering words or uh, something prophetic or, or interpreting a dream when God is trying to get their attention. It must be for someone else. It must be for someone else. And so this is why discernment is so important. But is it anchored in love? Is it, is it kind? Is it patient? You know, is, is it with pure motive? All of these things are essential when it comes to the prophetic and the kingdom. The third one, I'm just going to go through these really quickly. Is it shifting us toward deep, deeper and further into God's story? I love what Gary said this morning. I loved it because it's so true when it applies to it. Uh, interpreting our dreams and our visions and the prophetic and, and hearing from God, uh, that the Holy Spirit is always bringing us into God's story, into his story. We're stepping into his story. He shapes our story as we step into his story. And as we step into his story, history unfolds. And God's story is always redemptive. There's been a lot of prophetic stuff over the last few years that have been anchored in this absolutely terrible eschatology end time stuff you know it's been doom and gloom uh prophetic stuff and it's not anchored in scripture because god always breathes hope he always breathes life he god is the most my father is the most optimistic person i know and so he's, he's always leading us into that perspective by the holy spirit and uh and so let's let's echo where to be an echo of his voice an echo of our Father's heart, an echo of Jesus. And, and so if you're hearing anything else, scrap it. Because it's just people who are, who are caught up, who, who like to have God rubber stamp their agendas or their ism or their ideology rather than step into his story, which is all heading towards the glory of the Lord filling the earth as the water covers the sea, the knowledge of his glory. The tide is always rising God is taking us on a journey, all of humanity, despite what's happening, to a marvellous future, to a beautiful future, when Jesus returns at the end of the age, this age that we're in. And I love the fourth thing is, what's the Holy Spirit saying in all of this? I need to say this. Uh, I, I'm not particularly a dreamer, and so I'm, who was talking about dream, some of the testimonies I loved this morning, because uh, I, I, I would like to step into that a bit more. Um, I enjoy my sleep, and every now and again I dream. More often than not, it's from what I ate during the night uh, when I do dream. But every now and again, there's this, you know, I, I hear the voice of God in my dreams. And, and a lot of it is because uh, if you listened to last week, uh, the clip, which you all obviously did, uh, God needs to get our attention some way. And sometimes we busy our lives so much, the only time he can get our attention is at night. When we're, when we're asleep. And so often that's why we dream more. If we just took more time during the day to just wait and be still before him, we would step into a life of being a, a visionary, having visions, and, uh, which I want to keep doing, Pastor Craig, because there's the young men that have visions. And so I'm glad I don't dream that much. And so I'm sorry if you're dreaming as a young person, but uh, I haven't reached that yet. So, What's the Holy Spirit saying in this? So, but our dream life and, our, and, and the, the seeing in the Spirit doesn't replace our hearing from God. As a matter of fact, our hearing from God is anchored. Uh, our, our understanding, our dream life and our visionary life, sorry, is anchored in our being able to hear his voice because our, his sheep know his voice. 
and are familiar with his voice. The Holy Spirit that's in you. And, and so I love this in John chapter 16 where Jesus says, uh, I've, I've told you so many things in figurative language. I've painted pictures for you, parables and stories. But a time is coming, this time when the Holy Spirit is going to come, when I'll no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I'll tell you plainly about the Father. So the Holy Spirit, and hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, he brings clarity into our dreams and into our vision. He brings clarity into our, our every day. And uh, because we've now stepped into this new relational covenant with, with, with God, with our Father, where we can hear from him with clarity, which actually is our normal posture in the kingdom. And so as we understand that and we're hearing his voice and we're living in this place of relational dialogue, communion with the Holy Spirit, his presence brings perspective to our dreams and our visions. So the dream and the visions are not a replacement for first hearing from him. And it's important that we understand that. And uh, John 16, Jesus says these words. I, loved, I love this. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth about your dreams and about your visions. Okay? And he'll do it with clarity. He will not speak on his own accord. He'll speak whatever he hears, as Jesus hears what the, what's the Father saying, and he'll declare these things to you that are to come. In other words, he'll speak what's to come. And so revelation comes as we tune in to what the Holy Spirit wants to say, and he'll do it with clarity because of this new season, this covenant that we live in where the Holy Spirit indwells our very being. And he's not only fills our life, but he's with us. <laughs> We're familiar with his voice. Uh, and he'll glorify me in this. And so in doing that, we're bring, he's bringing glory to the Father. He's bringing glory to Jesus. And so, again, another filter uh, is, is what, we're, what we're dreaming, what we're seeing, is what we're hearing bringing glory to the Father. Or is it just building my own ego? Or building my own uh, ism or ideology or is, is, is it pointing to him and pointing to his love and pointing to Jesus and pointing to the cross and pointing to the, 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 the line of history that our father is taking us into which is all good hmm. I love it thank you Lord Lord may we continue to see you may every may our filters of discernment and wisdom be anchored in you, Jesus, in your word, in your words, in your way of love, in the way of the cross. May our words be redemptive. May our words bring reconciliation. May our words bring wholeness. May our understanding of what you're showing us be redemptive. May it be filtered every time through love because your father we understand that you are love that every attribute of your nature is a manifestation of your love and so i pray that every at attribute of our singing of our dream life of our hearing will likewise be an attribute of your love and so be kind never be ego driven be caring encouraging be comforting be building into people's lives thank you lord and father help us to be awake to you awake to your presence awake to you holy spirit to your voice to be sensitive to your voice which echoes the father's heart help us i pray for each of us here tonight that are part of this church and your church lord understand that you bring clarity you're the one who brings clarity and brings glory to the father and so may our words our discerning our understanding our dreams the way we interpret our dreams bring glory to you and build the body of christ in your name i pray amen amen um so it's just as before i hand over to bethany is there any questions from last week does anyone have any think uh, from our Swiss friends that you uh, 
triggered a question for you. It was pretty simple and straightforward, wasn't it? I just thought Craig hosted it so well and they, the guys spoke so well. Um, you did that at 6.30 in the morning? Yeah. Okay. Did well, Craig. Any questions from what I've just said? You, you all get that? Okay. Awesome. Uh, I said to the, tonight, my role is really just to facilitate Bethany's giftedness, and I am so uh, grateful that we have Bethany and Terry as a part of our church. What Bethany carries is just absolutely beautiful, and she, she does it all with grace. And uh, all in the in, in the framework of those things that I talked about. And uh, so, can we w give Bethany a hand as she comes to teach us? Okay. So, dreams are something that I'm really passionate about. I'm actually passionate about hearing the Lord's voice and having encounters with him, but I believe that dreams are an encounter. Yeah, yeah. I believe that dreams are significant because we just hear his voice. There are both simple and more complex dreams. There are dreams with deeper layers. So... Just be careful when you get a dream and you think you've got the answer, not to gloss over it. Be prepared to wait on the Lord for more meaning because the Lord wants to continually train us and teach us. And it's always about going deeper. And as Craig said this morning, he responds to hunger and he responds to our stewardship. He's the best trainer and mentor, absolutely the best. And I, I just want to say before I continue any further, thank you, Craig and Wayne, for your confidence. Um, I am passionate about this, but I, I don't take it lightly. It's um, to, to be able to help people hear the Lord and to be able to interpret well and continually grow in that, is, is, it's a phenomenal privilege. So tonight I'm going to do a little bit of teaching on dream interpretation foundations and then we're going to look at some activities to look at how to determine who's the dream about and what's the context of the dream. What area of our lives does it pertain to? And then we're actually going to do a dream that I had and run through how I interpret it with uh, the dictionary and what I'd been praying about. So Wayne spoke about Acts 2 that uh, is a fulfilment of Joel 2.28 and said, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons, listen to the age groups, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions and your old men will see dreams. So a lot of people have a lot of different ideas what this pertains to. And I would suggest that if you want to have a little bit better understanding that Adam Thompson and Adrian Beale's book on the Divinity Code, page 21 to 31, gives a, a, a different um, interpretation. But another one that I've read it said that it just covers all age groups. God was going to pour his spirit on all age groups. So if you hear God in a dream, you're a fulfillment of that verse. So in dreams, he speaks to us in an individualised language. So he speaks differently to an artist as opposed to a plumber. A teacher to a nurse. He speaks differently. And you learn the language that he uses for you personally over time. So dreams are very, very personal. We must steward our dreams because... As I said, God wants to take us to deeper, deeper, deeper levels in the process of interpreting the dreams and the spheres that it relates to. And when we become confident 
and steward it well, he knows to trust us and it's about building trust. So I have to say, whilst I, I don't believe in any way that I've got supernatural ability or that I'm a great dream interpreter, but I started going after this 20 years ago, about 20 years ago, when I heard the, the church in Byron Bay setting up a tent to, in a New Age festival to interpret dreams and I thought, that is one great way to witness to people. What a great way. So I just went after it. I, I read a lot of stuff. I looked up stuff. I, you know, I just went after it and after it and after it. And I have to say it was just on the basis of asking and stewarding that God increased it in my life. But it hasn't just been about getting knowledge. It's about being and developing a relationship along the way. It's always a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's an interdependency ongoing. Dreams usually relate to our sphere of influence. So they're usually about ourselves unless we've got a, a role as a manager or a leader or a pastor or we're in a, in a place where we're actually interceding in that area. But they're usually about ourselves. The purpose of dreams are an invitation to ask questions. The Lord always invites us into his space. He said we can come in through the veil. He, he, he creates a question in a, in a dream, so we will go to him for an answer that he's already got ready before he gave us the, the dream. He desires to align us to his purpose. And sometimes he wants to expose the intent and the things in our heart that we didn't know about. <clears throat> and he wants to reveal himself to us. There's a never-ending character of God that we continually come to learn about through dreams. His love, his goodness, his faithfulness. It's... It's a fantastic experience. The other side is that we learn through dreams that he knows us intimately. Yeah. That's, that's outstanding. Yeah. Terry, can I have the first overhead, please? Oh, sorry, the second overhead, sorry. So there are categories of dreams that people talk about. But God is, God is not limited or bound by a list. So John Paul Jackson, um, the late John Paul Jackson, who, was, who had the gift of, of interpreting dreams and was astonishing with it, he said there were 21 categories Someone else said there are 18. Some people say there are seven. It depends on how you study the actual dreams in the scripture. Terry, could I have the second overhead, please? Thank you, and thank you for your help. So there are dreams of destiny and calling, edification, exhortation, and these are from actual Bible dreams. That's how they got the, how they've been put into a category. Dreams of comfort, dreams of correction, direction, warning, instruction, cleansing. And cleansing dreams are not to say that we've lost our salvation. They're about alignment. Self-condition, the similar thing, revealing the heart and where we stand with God. Again, not that we've fallen out of salvation, but to draw us in closer. Spiritual warfare. Creativity, inventions, new ways of doing things. Impartation, some people have anointings imparted to them. Intercession or a call to intercession. Faith and healing, people get healed in dreams to impart courage and, 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 and strength. Revelation, people get words of knowledge about people they might be going to meet the next day to how, and how to pray for them. And prophetic understanding. People get delivered in dreams. 
there are two more types of dreams that I believe is the disclosing or the revealing of secrets, which is similar to word of knowledge, but can be a little bit different. The answering of questions and problem solving. Often, T Terry doesn't get a lot of dreams, but if he goes to bed he's got, and he's got a project that he's working on in the garage and he doesn't know how to solve a problem, he'll go to bed thinking about how it, he's going to solve it and he gets a dream on how to solve it, a building thing. So repeated dreams, we can have repeated dreams because the Lord wants us to address something and maybe we didn't understand it or we didn't pay attention to it. So he gives us repeated dreams with heightened emphasis and maybe more descriptive so that we pay attention. But he doesn't go crook on us. He just gives us another dream and another dream. There's no berating. The louder it gets, the more he wants us to pay attention. So we might be travelling in a wrong direction, making wrong choices. There might be danger ahead. He might be saying, stop, turn around, don't go in that direction. And it goes from maybe a gentle up to a more dramatic emphasis in the dream. So a correction, as I said, is to call to alignment. I just want to clarify one point. A heightened emotional effect or dramatic sense in a dream is to get our attention. It doesn't necessarily mean if it's so significant it must be for someone else. It just means he's trying to get our attention. Or it's something he wants you to do now. He doesn't want it to go on. I mean, there can be real danger. And God, you know, don't go that way to work today. Job 33, 14 says, Even twice, yet no one notices it. This is the Amplified. Yet no one notices it, including you, Job. This is Job's friends talking to him. A dream, a vision of the night. One may hear God's voice when deep sleep falls on men while they sleep on their beds. He opens the ears of men and seals their instruction that he may turn them from his conduct to keep him from pride. So God continually works with us, not at us, with us. The easy, easy to read version says, but maybe God does explain what he, what he does, but he speaks in ways that people don't understand. He may speak in a dream or a vision of the night while people are in a deep sleep on their beds. He may whisper something in their ear and they're frightened when they hear his warnings. God warns people to stop them from wrong, wrongdoing and to keep them from becoming pride, proud. So we're going to look at sources of dreams now because there are three sources of dreams. One, God. Two, our soul. And three, from the enemy. So God's both the author and the interpreter. Both Joseph and Daniel in the scriptures who had gifts of interpretation, both of them said God was the author and God was the interpreter. And you lean into the Lord always to get an interpretation. In Numbers 12.6 it says, Listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions and I speak to the, them in dreams. Is there any prophetic person here tonight? Yes. Excellent. So we should be having dreams. So dreams, because we're prophetic, will elicit or will draw a prophetic response. In Acts 16, Paul was, had a dream from a man where, where a man from Macedonia stood and called him to go and preach the gospel in Macedonia. In Matthew chapter 2, well, Joseph got dreams about leaving Egypt, yeah. leaving, leaving to go to Egypt or away from where, he was to, where Jesus was born to save the life of Jesus. And, and the wise men, like as well, they were warned not to go to Herod. But in Matthew 27, 19... Pilate's wife, who wasn't a believer, got a, got a dream. 
And he said, she says, I've suffered much because of Jesus today in a dream. So she warned Pilate not to have anything to do with him. So God speaks to all people. The soul. It says in Ecclesiastes 5.3, when it, a dream comes, when many cares, when there are many cares and desires overwhelm us. So when there's incredible yearning for something, and young people sometimes do this when they want to find the right partner, and they're, they're, they're just looking all the time with their radar, and they go to bed with this overwhelming desire. And I had someone in a previous church, and a guy came up to me and he said, I've had this dream about this woman, and I think God's telling me. She's the one for me. And I said, mm, it's symbolic. No, 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 I've, I've talked to my best friend, and he agrees. <laughs> she wasn't. It, the dream was symbolic. So the enemy. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's a liar, and if he gives dreams, they're counterfeit. They're, they're false. They produce, and you know them. I've had one that I remember. Deception, fear, torment, unsettledness, destruction, dis disruption, and they lead us away from Christ. There's always that sense that, that is not peaceful when your dream comes from the enemy. Thessalonians 1, 1 Thessalonians 5.20 says, Test everything and hold fast to what is good. So what would you do if you had a soulish dream? continually that were coming just from the needs and the overwhelmingness of your soul pray before you go to bed and cast all your cares upon the lord invite his peace to come in to every area where you're feeling overwhelmed surrender your emotions to the lord what would you do if you were having dreams from the enemy If you, if you need help, leaders here are available to help you with. But we've got this, the authority in Jesus' name to rebuke the enemy. And you do it. Pray over your night. I surrender my nights to the Lord. Those hours I'm sleeping belong to him and him only. Him only. So re rebuke the enemy, shut the door, place the blood of Jesus on the doorway, the doorway of us. And if you're still having trouble... I'd recommend that you speak to our leaders. This is a good place for me to talk about dream resources because not all dream, source, dream dictionaries and sources and websites align with scripture. They can look like they do. Sometimes they're called Christian, but they're not. Okay? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Everything, as Wayne said, has to line up with who Jesus is and how he, told us, how he told us to live and what the Bible teaches us. So we need to check if they agree with Scripture. And I, I just want to say dream moods, dream Bible and Auntie Flo, they're not. There are many out there that are not lined up with Scripture. So the Lord speaks in parables, metaphors and symbols as he did in the New Testament. A symbol means something. It, it means something that means or represents something else. Like, for example, the dove. We, always, we all know the dove represents peace. And a symbol or a picture paints a thousand words. That's why movies and internet and gaming are so popular because they draw us into the visual realm. Pictures tell us so much more than words do, and they're easier to remember. So, Terry, could we have the next slide up, please? I'm just going to show you an example of this. We're just going to look at that word. Okay, thank you. That's really impressive, isn't it? Mm. 
Is that better? So just like the waterfall, we remember images and sounds more easily than we, re we remember written words. And that's why, that's one of the reasons he gives us dreams with pictures and not just a screed of words, not just a story written. He chooses to bypass our logical, rational brains. And that's why dreams are mostly when we're asleep. He entices us to search for answers. As I said, it's an invitation to come and ask, is there any wonder children love the game, the game hide and seek? They instinctively know that to find something is a, is a really good experience. Proverbs 25.2 said, God is praised for being mysterious. Rulers are praised for explaining mysteries or in the, in the New Living Translation, it's God's privilege to conceal something, but it's the king, that's us, it's the king's privilege to discover it. Yeah. We're privileged people if we get a dream. Yeah. Could I have uh, the next slide, please, Terry? So how do metaphors or symbols get their meaning? Firstly, there's an inherent character represented in the, in the symbol, for example, we know the symbols of the lamb and the wolf. The lamb's the innocent little thing that needs, that's got no, no natural defences. The wolf is the aggressor. Personal experience is number two. That's the way we perceive it because God speaks to us in an individualised language. So how would you perceive the waterfall as opposed to me perceiving the waterfall? It might be totally different. It might be to me wet and overwhelming and to someone else it might be marvellous and place to meditate. So an ant might be something that someone finds a biting nuisance and they hate it, whereas someone else might find it industrious and teamworking and persevering. A dog can be someone's best friend and another person, oh, they don't like it, they bark too much or they bite. So thirdly, culture. Did you know that the colour red in Africa is for mourning? In China it means good luck and in the Western culture it's about danger. Fourthly, the Bible. And this is not fourth due to a lower emphasis but it's the first reference in the Bible. You know, the Christ was seen as the lion. There are multiple references in the Bible of symbols that give layers of meaning that we will forever be, be finding out. So Christ is the lion. Satan went around as a roaring lion. So the Bible we refer to as our main source in interpreting dreams. Symbol, symbols and metaphors have, as, as we looked at the lion, have a, a positive, thank you, have, can have a positive and a negative meaning. So they can actually have more than one. So we have to be objective and flexible. They create in us a hunger to know. And you know, God knows the best way to get to our hearts. He really, he really, really does. It's always an invitation to come and he never, ever lords it over us. He could, but he never lords it over us. Pictures promote engagement and through engagement, change in our life can occur. And he wins us to himself through relational experiences and thereby demonstrates his love. Isn't that, isn't that just outstanding? If you thought of all the years of your life, if you had a dream every night till the time when you end, he would be continually demonstrating his love to you. Next slide, please, Terry. So the interpretive process of dreams and outline. You can ask God for dreams. You can just ask. And if, and if you don't get a dream, don't stop asking. Just don't stop. It's, if you don't get a dream, it's not him saying no. 
wake gently. That's hard for sometimes sometimes for people when they've got to get up at a certain time to go to work. But someone in, I read once that instead of having alarm where a, a loud noise goes off to put classical or worship music on, so that might put some people to sleep back to sleep again, I know, but the jarring can often cause the, the remembrance of the, the visual images to go. So I lie there in bed quietly and I said, Lord, did I dream last night? Show me at least one picture. Show me at least one image. If you get one, you can likely get more. As soon as possible, record your dream, however you want to record it, and write the, scene down, the first scene down accurately as you saw it in the dream, not as you think logically it should have been. Exactly. So the first scene, record your emotions and your actions and pray and ask the Lord. Ask him to give you understanding. There's sometimes time involved in the when the Lord wants to give you the understanding and sometimes it's more about drawing you aside to him than actually getting the answers, although he wants to, you to have the answers. But it's, 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 if not more important for us to come into his presence and be listening. Write down the symbol. So I, I write my dream down. I title it, put the date on it. So, you know, like if I'm having, if it was basically about a picnic, I'd write picnic. It was about driving to work, driving to work. Just the simple title. Because it, it just locates the dream. So the title, the date, where I am on holidays, at home. And uh, then just write the dream out. Then I write, um, you can write it out double spaced or you can just write it out. And then just write a list of your symbols. There's lots of different ways of recording your dreams. You can even draw them. Then you, then you look at trying to find out the meaning of each word. And then when you find the meaning of each word, you'll often find that a dream that you thought was from spaghetti bolognese is actually a real dream from the Lord, you know? And we miss it. Then we've got to ask, what's the dream about? And as I'll show in a minute, it's always got to do with finding out who the dream's about and what's the context of the dream. Then something that we can, uh, we can learn to do ongoing is our response to the dream. It's not just about finding out what it means. It's, it's praying into the dream. It's responding to what God's saying in the dream. If he's telling us to come aside and pray or to change in a certain area or to go somewhere or to intercede, it's important that we do that because that's part of stewarding. So dreams, and I'm near to where we're going to do an activity, just so you know. Dreams are mostly symbolic. There is a rule that says, if there's an object that cannot be taken literally, the whole dream should be taken symbolically. So if I have a dream that I've got a, a red RAV4, then, and everything else in the dream, is current to my current situation, I'll take it literally. I've got a red RAV4. If in a dream I'm driving a blue RAV4, and even if everything else is similar or the same as my current life, because I don't own a blue RAV4, the dream is to be interpreted symbolically. Is that clear? Usually it's about our immediate situations, but it can be about our past, present or future. As I said, there are very varied meanings and places where our dreams can land. We need to be careful not to rush the interpretation. There isn't a rush unless it's one of those dreams where God's talking to us about danger. But the Holy Spirit is the spirit of counsel and understanding. And he's the one we go to because he will give us an answer to a dream. And, and the more you, I've, I've discovered that the more I press into the Lord for the answer of the dream, 
the more likely I am to get it if I take the time. However, there are some dreams that we don't get an answer for until a particular time that he wants and feels is the right time for us to come into the interpretation. So you just leave it there and be praying. I also write in, I have a dream journal that I write all my dreams in, but I have a diary and if every time I have a dream on the top of the page, I write dream and the title of the dream just to locate it in my diary. And that way, if I haven't had an interpretation, I can, I can remember because it's in my dream, in my, in my journal, and I've got a re an easier record because when you have a lot of dreams, they can get lost in time. I used to dream when I went after it. I used to dream three dreams a night. And um, it was challenging to have a quiet time and interpret my dreams before I went to work. I had a season where I'd have three dreams, one, dr one dream for three nights, and the Lord would give me assignments in those dreams. And when I had prayed through those assignments, he'd give me another three. It changes. So who does the dream refer to? Where am I in the dream? Am I a participant, participant, an observer, or both? Tonight we're going to talk about participant and observer. And if you want to know what to do if you're a participant and observer, come back next week. So a participant is in first-person language. For example, I was at a place and we were caring for four young animals. This is one of my dreams. The donkey named Naaman, a little bird, a duckling and others needed proper food. If, a, if someone's called by a name, there's a significance. Did you see that? A donkey named Naaman, a little bird that had no name, a duckling was no name. That's just a clue. I was looking at lace material on the floor. I was driving looking for the address of a lady. We were in a new place. That meant myself and others. So depending on the rest of the dream, that dream can either mean that it's about me and others or it's just about me associating with others, but still it's first person. So I'm the participant. I'm the one that God's speaking to. An observer. So, I, it, so the language for being an observer in, in a dream is I saw, I watched, and it's, it's usually you're in a position being above, over, or an advantage place where you can see. It can be either spoken or implied because you might not be saying I saw, you just start talking about what you saw. So, for example, this was a dream. There were three men in a building talking, one left, and when the other two men had finished talking, a man, Clint Eastwood, left and went outside down external stairs. That's an important point. When he reached his car, the man from inside came out on the stairs and started shooting at him. It's implied that I was watching but I didn't think when I was writing it down to say, I saw. But nowhere in the dream am I involved. So I'm the observer. It's not about me. It's very important that we get this connection because it brings so much clarity to being able to interpret your dream. Dream context. What's the setting? So the setting is in the, in the first scene. When you see a scene that you're working, it relates to your work. If you see a scene in your home, it's going to relate to you. So I've got some examples here. This is a dream Al had. I, we, I was in a rural place. This was his language with ro green rolling hills with other people. It was like a community conference centre and people were talking about the manifestation of God's glory. This is about Al. It's about him with other people around him, but it's primary about Al. The rural... You, you sometimes don't find the word that you've used 
in a dictionary or in the Bible. So you have to look up words around it. So rural could be countryside. Countryside means a space to think a quiet time of peace, tranquility and prayer meditation. Julie's dream. I had a dream where Daryl and I lived in a house or a castle. She mentions castle. That was very old but had been refurbished and modernised. The castle was so large with so many rooms and lots of bedrooms, bathrooms and living rooms. We had many people staying over. Most of them were Christians hanging out in, large, in groups, mingling casually all over the castle. This is a dream about Julie and Daryl. I had a dream where Daryl and I, it's that they're the, they're the focus, they're the people this dream's about. Is this helping? Another dream. This was mine. My family and I were moving, moving house, so we were packing up. This is about me and my family. I was in a house, not recognised with others, family but not recognised, and a wind began to blow outside and I could see the wind through the windows how strong it was. This is about, this is about um, myself and the people, my family, that are in this house. Another dream. I was working at a Hunter New England Health office building and another co-worker co and I stayed back to finish work. This is about my work. This pertains to my how I'm relating or something happening in my work. I was in a line with people from church who I recognised waiting to board a train. This is a, is, this is a dream that relates to myself and the church people, where we're going in the church. I drove to work through a shortcut road. This is about me in my... In my um, how, so, so driving or, or, or going in a car is talking about how we get ahead, how we steering our life through work. So it's got to do with my work, but it's got to do with how I'm getting there, where I'm going, how I'm proceeding, how I'm making decisions. Is that understandable? Okay. So we're going to do a... An in, a, a dream interpretation now that I had recently and we'll have the slide up please Terry going, going to um, have a look at this dream have a look at the meaning of the words and how we derive the right description of each word to bring about an interpretation. Yes, so I'd been invited for, I had been invited for a meal at someone's place. I was in a room in a house waiting for the meal. I saw a long table prepared and I noticed many, many shoes lying all over the floor. There was a lady preparing the meal. I was looking at the shoes that were all over the floor and I was thinking if I should help put them away as they were everywhere and they looked a mess. Then the ladies asked us to put them away. There were other people invited to the meal. So I recorded this dream and I'll tell you after I've gone through this, these possible meanings... what happened later. So I wrote down the, all the words and I thought, who's this about? Well, it says I. I had been invited to a meal, so it's about me. Is that okay? Is that clear? There is a second layer to this that I'll explain later. What's the context of this meal, this, this dream? says, I was in a room of a house. So a room can be the chamber of your heart. It can be a storage place where you have memories, strongholds, a particular aspect of a person, as opposed to a house. So you can sometimes write that you were in a house or that you were in a home. You need to possibly look up both so that you really get the right sense of the word. There's a little bit of a difference. 
So, so a room is a chamber of your heart where the house is actually the individual or the personality, the character. It, it can mean your body or the church. It can be a household covering because a house has got a roof on it. It can be a, a dwelling place of spirits, both good and bad. So the invitation, which is really interesting, is a formal request for presence. God pursuing your attention. That's starting to speak something about the dream, isn't it? So a meal doesn't, didn't appear in the, in the dictionary, um, but it does in scripture. Table does appear in scripture too. But I looked up food, dinner, feast and meat. It talks about spiritual encounter, nourishment, mind renewal, revelation, being aligned with. Table. Meal. I've missed out table, sorry. Table is communication, communion, fellowship, nourishment and aligning with someone. In the Bible, it was where covenants were made. They sat down at a table to, to create a covenant. It's about union with Christ. So what does large mean? Large means there's room to accommodate. So at this table, and Terry's made a great, great picture. On the next slide. And the table itself was spread with, it was just amazing. It was white, beautiful, silver cutlery. It, it was just astonishingly beautiful. But I didn't pay much attention to the table as I paid attention to the shoes. They are what caught my attention. So, prepared. I thought, is that something I should be paying attention to? But there was nothing in the dictionary and I realised it probably wasn't so pertinent. It does have a relevance to the, to the dream, but it's not quite as pertinent as the rest of them. So, lady. So, so you can just leave that and wait on God. You know, if you don't get one word, that's all right, unless it's to do with the context. So, the, the, the lady is often representative of the Holy Spirit. It can mean the church. It can mean the, a female head of the household. Shoes. Shoes represent different roles, preparation, or the nature of one's walk. Our character and how we do our work. Is this sounding all right? Apologise for my writing. Put away. Does anyone here heard that in the scripture? To put away something, it's there. It means it can. The dictionary says it can be to organise, but from scripture, it, it means to separate from, not associate with, come away from. People. In the dream, it refers to others, I didn't know them, others that would have been invited to the meal. Then I'd been praying for a while about this because I really sensed uh, a, a high value. And I'll tell you that I've been praying for encounters for a long time, but I want them personally in my home, not just at church. So I've been praying for encounters with the Lord. And I think it was really pertinent that he gave me this dream last week so that I could talk about it tonight. So as I was praying and getting an, an interpretation, I suddenly realised my focus had been on the shoes and not on the meal, not on the invite. So I went back. I went back and I looked at the table and white means righteousness. A tablecloth means culture and good planning. It's the culture of heaven. Silver is redemptive. Like this table was beautiful. It was light and reflective and, and just the highest standard. Cuddlery. I didn't see 
a great relevance to having to need to have a, have a meaning for that. So I've left it for the time being. I don't think it is. Beautiful, if you see something beautiful, it draws you to it. It makes an impression upon you. You want, you want to go there and be there. But my focus was on the shoes. So I thought, well, shoes is really important for me to understand in this dream. So what's the meaning? Immediately, Psalm 23, verse 5 came to me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. My cup runneth over. He anoints my head with oil. Like, that's pretty good. <laughs> so can you see, do, you're starting to get an idea of what this dream's about. It's an invitation to come to the Lord, to spend time with him, to put away the various roles and activities, to step away from titles and work and anything that's associated with it and just simply come to the meal, simply come to the table. There's already a meal prepared and re ready. There's revelation from him to come and be a part of him, to be a part of his story, to eat, to have a personal exchange, to meet Jesus in just abandonment, enjoyment and in covenant discussion. Do you understand how I came to that through those? Can you see that through, through these descriptive meanings of symbols? What's, what's the second layer of this? The second layer was that other people had been invited. We're all invited. So how do I respond? What's my response to this dream? Anyone got any ideas? So, so firstly, me, I got it. You know, I've been praying for encounters for a long, long time, and there's been an an unconscious thought that I've had that I'm waiting for him to come from it to me, and he's saying, "Come to him." You know, and we think we do this, we, we think we do this, but this has been a very, very specific dream that it's already, already organised and, and it was outstandingly beautiful, outstandingly beautiful. So the Lord wants to come because this is not just for me, there were other people invited to the meal, we're all invited to come and have a, have a meal with the Lord where he encountered us, encounters us. I, I, um, dreams are amazing, really, really amazing. So my response is personally then to make time, to come aside with the Lord, to separate myself, to be deliberate and just set aside time to come without any agendas. You know, even take my shoes off. That might seem funny, but Sometimes it, it means things. Sometimes it does something. And the second response that I would have, other than spending time and listening, is to pray other people into that same space. To really pray that people come and people have time and that they can set, an, set aside time, that they can, you know, in their busyness, that we can somehow change the order of our day or the importance and come to the Lord who's, who's made a very specific dream to tell us that he's waiting. This is what this dream's about, he's waiting. I just think that's marvellous. If that doesn't make us want to dream more, you know. Okay. Am I going for time? So any questions? Next week we're going to do more activities. Yes? You mentioned the uh, dictionary. Could you explain which one you use or how you yep. access that? So I use 
a number of dictionaries, both on my phone and hardcover. Adrian Thompson and Adam Beals, Adam Thompson and Adrian Beals' book, Divinity Code, is a good starting place. Um, Dr. J Joey Boji is one of the early writers, and it's uh, it's got a simple explanation of um, both dream interpretation and a, and a short sort of a dictionary. Barbie Breathitt from America, she's got the gift of dream interpretation. Her her book is a fifty dollar book. It costs fifty dollars to bring it out from America. Terry got it for me as a gift. I use it every day. It's it's an expensive investment. There, um, there's an uh, Ira Melligan is one of the early interpreters. Um, understanding your dreams, I think it's called. It, it's an old book, but he's one of the first people that, one of the early people that talked about dreams. His he talks about not just a, a, a basic dictionary, but he talks about the progressive, the ability to understand dreams, dream numbers in a progressive way that's very, 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 very good. Better, it, it, yeah, better than a lot of people. He, he, he talks about one because God multiplies things and they start with your basic numbers and they multiply through the tens and twenties, through to the hundreds, through to the thousands. And there are different, many different ways to interpret numbers, and I'll talk more about that next week. So those, those are my main hardcover ones. And then I've got online... Um, Joshua Media Ministries has a really good online free dictionary you can download to your phone. Tyler Wolf has another one. Prophetic Dreamers is a site that's been um, renovated. And they put up a, a note in October, this, this October, to say that it's coming soon. When it comes, it's going to be extraordinary. It was extraordinary before they did the refurbishment. It's going to be extraordinary. And they run a course. So they're free dictionaries on your phone when you go away and you don't want to take your huge hard copies with you. But I find the use of more than one dictionary helped me much more than just having one. And I know that costs money but if, if you're buying hard copy, but uh, this is something special to me that I go after in a, long, in a big way. Um, Do you have the record of those uh, dictionaries in your notes that you want? No, I don't. Sorry. I can... Send, I can... How do you want me? Next week. Yeah, okay. Next week I can put them down. Yeah. Any other questions? D did you get the whole thing about participant... An observer. Did you get understanding the context? The first sen the first scene in the dream relates to how where it pertains to in your life. Is that clear? Okay. Any other questions? No. Excellent. You will have more dreams now. <laughs> this opens up. Already, it's opened up. People are dreaming more. But you, you know. Just coming here indicates to the Lord that you're hungry and that he responds. You know, it's like, yeah, so expect dreams. There's one thing I didn't, I want to emphasize again. When there's an added emphasis in a dream, even if it's an emotion or, a, you know, um, it's a heightened sense of significance. That's not an indicator that the dream's about someone else. You always look to see whether you are the observer the, or the participant or the observer. And the first scene, what area of my life does this pertain to? If you are an observer and you think this pertains to the church, then I would suggest you always bring it to the leaders. Always. Get, get the interpretation out. Ask for help. You can always ask for help. I'm available. But the dream is given to you so you will seek after God. I, absolutely, I'm available to help. But make it, make it a thing, you know, that you'll go after it. Because that's what God responds to. I understand the community thing and 
if I'd had more help, I might have been further along than, than I am now. But it's not always been easy to interpret my dreams. There are dreams I have not interpreted. But that doesn't stop me going after more. Okay? So if you were an observer in a dream and you have someone else's face or someone involved in something else, how do you respond to that type of dream? Um, so it would depend on the way you interpreted the rest of the dream because the context tells you who it refers to. So if you saw someone's face and then comes a progressive meaning or a uh, progressive uh, story in the dream, so you've got to put it all together. So sometimes it's purely to pray for that person. The observer is, is usually to indicate something the Lord wants you to do. In the dream where I saw a man being shot at, I had to pray for that man. Dreams aren't actual things that have to or are going to happen. You can change them. You have the power to change them. And if you're an observer, that's what God is calling you to do often. Just pray. Pray. Determine in your heart that because he's given you the dream, you have the authority to say, no, that will not happen. It will not happen. And you pray into it and declare God's purposes over that person's life, his protection. Cause them to go in the right direction. Cause them to come to the truth. Cause them to step out of danger. The prayer is really, really powerful. You may not ever hear in those circumstances anything. You may not hear a response because God's answered your prayer. So no danger occurred. So don't think, oh, well, that was a waste of time. It wasn't. You changed someone's life for the better. Just because you didn't get an answer doesn't mean to say God didn't answer your prayer. Okay. Was that um, clear and helpful? Yep. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Craig. Yeah. Okay. So we thank you, Spirit of God. You are the revealer of the secrets of our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, Lord, I release dreams over everyone present and over the whole church, Lord. I release the ability to dream. I release the ability to remember dreams. I release hunger and a desire and I release ability to understand and interpret dreams. And Father, we come before you to become purposeful with what you speak to us and what you show us to do. Lord, we want your encounters. We want to hear your voice, but we want to respond to your will. So we yield to everything that you want to say to us in every way. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.